to do with your several times. So you won't have to do separate lessons in order to be able to fill out all your bridge to practice assignments. Next. I don't know why it's frozen. Oh, let's try one more time. Here we go. There we go. So as always, we have our professional development norms. Uh, they are be committed, be responsible, be respectful, and be safe. And you're here, so we know you are and can do and exhibit all of those traits and do them very well. So um, thank you for, for being the way that you are and being the responsible, wonderful, hardworking, committed teachers that you are. We would remind you to please keep your microphones uh, muted and your camera on if you're comfortable with that. And um, most, most everything that we do in professional development in Canyon School District revolves around our instructional framework. And this is our multi-tiered system of supports framework for academics and there are also behavior supports in here as well. Um, and today we are going to be in the academic column, um, exploring some of the practices that are in the interest of developing our abilities to uh, help our students learn and achieve at a higher level. I want to, I, I learned something recently that I want to share with you all, and that is that um, when you go into the Canyons U Canvas site, there are two places you can find the bite size PD information. One is, they're all done alphabetically. One is in the B's under bite size, and I know that might surprise you, but it's true. And there, there is this under the weekly bytes of PD listed there. If you go to the C's in the alphabetic uh, directory, you can find this slide. And this has the relicensure codes for all of the um, classes. So you can earn 0.5 credits of USBE for each of the bite size PDs and you just fill out the form, tell them which ones you completed and you will be rewarded those that credit. And that is what that looks like, just to give you an idea how, how you can do and university credit. Ooh. So each time we meet, we talk about the bridge to practice and the bridge to practice is the why of what we're doing, why we are doing the bridge to practice. What we know about teaching is that number one, we already know how to read. So it doesn't matter how much information we have, it's how we go about sharing that information and getting our students to learn the information. So uh, the idea is that knowing something is one thing, but actually doing it is something else. And it requires courage and the willingness to try something new that might be hard. And just like the, the guy in the picture here, I could tell you how to scuba dive I could tell you how to put on the equipment. I could tell you how cold the water is going to be, the temperature. I could tell you all of that. But until you actually jump off the boat backwards and dive in to the water, you don't really know it. And so doing it makes the difference. And that's, that's where you own it. That's where you really have the power to, to know it and be able to tell someone else about the experience. And that's why we do the bridge to practice.
sorry, it took me a second to go back and forth. So this is our agenda for the rest of our uh, time together. We're going to look at unit six, digging for meaning, understanding reading comprehension, focusing on the bridge to practice worksheets. We're also going to take a look at the observation forms, which are linked here. So when you see this on Canyon Jew page, you can download the forms yourself to take a look at them as well. And then we're going to have time for some questions and answers. All right, our learning intentions and success criteria. As you can see, we've uh, engineered the text using the wiser strategies uh, to help our students focus on what's important. So today we are learning comprehension strategies and routines so I can incorporate them into my classroom instruction to deepen student comprehension of text. And I'll know I have it when students can read the text and speak and write about it. The great thing about all of volume two, but especially six and seven, session or unit six and seven is that they really work with our wonders implementation. Wonders has students speaking about the text and writing about the text. And so the things that you're asked to do, especially in these two units, really align very well to what you're already doing in your classroom. All right, so se uh, session one, what's the goal of reading comprehension? This has you think before you even start a lesson, what are some of your case study students' weaknesses? Where might they have holes that you are going to need to scaffold in your lesson? What's stopping them from that ability to create a accurate mental model? If they can't visualize it, they probably can't understand it. So think of any weaknesses in background knowledge, vocabulary, syntax, reading skills, sentence structure, anything else that they might need some help with and what could you do to support them? And as you write that, um, as you review that, reflect on what you could do to support those areas, you might want to review the comprehension planning checklist. And I did have that open. Uh, you don't need to fill this out for any of the assignments. It's there as a tool, but for six, for unit six especially, we're focusing on that before reading and all of those things before reading that you can do to help your students comprehend. And I would strongly suggest that as you're looking at this, you kind of keep it or keep any notes from 6.1, 6.2, or anytime you use this list for the whole unit, because there are some assignments that build on each other that you can do together. Back. And just and in case you're, you're wondering, wondering that, that comprehension uh, check planning checklist is in the back of your wonders book in the resources section. Thank you. All right, session two. As you start to plan for a reading. So for session two, pick a passage and pick an upcoming passage. Don't go outside of wonders. Just pick the next one that's coming up and deliver it to your kids. This one you might want to do a little bit differently because it asks you to have your students read the passage and answer some comprehension questions and then have you read the passage and have the kids answer the same questions and compare how they did. Do they have a much better listening comprehension capacity than they do reading comprehension capacity? And so there are lots of ways you can do this. You could take the passage that you're going to read tomorrow and preview that text with them in small group and do this activity. Or you could um, just do the reading part in small group and then have them listen to the read aloud if you're using the read aloud. So there are many ways you can do that, but it wants you to do those two things and ask the questions. So think of the best way with a text that's upcoming that you could compare their listening comprehension to their reading comprehension. For session three, can you go back? Oh, I went too far, sorry. For session <laughs> three, you are going to go back to that uh, planning document. And these, this is the before reading part of that document that's at the top. So these are all the things that you are going to be thinking about you, what you can do 
to prepare your students for their reading. So to get them suited so that they can comprehend, because that's the purpose of reading is to make meaning from text. But we need to set them up so that they can get as much out of that text as they can. So you're establishing the purpose for reading, which as you might remember, is very clearly defined for each read in wonders, which is really wonderful because we don't have to come up with that on our own. You will identify the text structure, which again, they do very well in the wonders program in saying today we're going to read a blah, blah genre. And um, I think it's important to explain the difference between, say, um, explanatory and narrative text or informational. And so we want to be very clear so that kids can develop that background and that mindset for going into and understanding the text on a, as deep a level as they can. You want to prepare them, giving them background knowledge. Background knowledge will prepare them, again, to be able to dive into and understand what they're reading, because if they don't have that background knowledge, there's no way they can grasp or enjoy or be entertained by what they're reading. They'll just be mystified and be like, I don't know. So it's really important that even things that um, that's going to vary from school to school, because some kids may have very different exposures and you know your class, you know what, you know, they might be exposed to or not exposed to, have background knowledge of um, what you are going to need to give them to scaffold that for them. And thinking through that wiser lens for especially your case study students is going to really help you with that background knowledge as far as you know, what is the inquiry that goes along with what you're reading? What is this speaking and listening? What, what are the pictures? So the reading and viewing, all of that. The vocabulary, again, we're learning about that in unit five and vocabulary is 50 to 60% of comprehension. So they need to know the words in order to be able to get the meaning from the text. And very different scaffolding, with or what different scaffolding will your case study students need? So thinking about their different exposures in the world, their different languages, all of that kind of thing. And your reflection at the very bottom of this is how did they comprehend the passage? And was your scaffolding appropriate for helping your case study students understand? And then you're probably gonna realize there might be some things as you continue through unit six, that you're going to want to maybe do differently. And as you get to know your kids better, because we're still really early in the year, you'll have a better feel for where you need to scaffold more heavily. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, we'll just keep rolling. And session 6.4, how to sentence structure affect comprehension. There's a lot of information in the book about this. And I wanted to show you a couple things that I tagged here. I don't know if you can see that, but I will give you the page number. It looks kind of blurry for me. Um, it's page 118. And there's a, a table that shows the features of challenging sentences. And I think that it's very helpful in where kids might get caught up and confused in their reading. So it talks about things like a passive voice, double negatives, conditional verb forms, all of those may be stumbling blocks for your kids. And then on the very next page, 119, voila, it talks about what can teachers do. So it's a whole list of things that you can do that will help to scaffold that kind of complicated sentence structure for your kids so they can comprehend those sentences. So things like orally paraphrase and ask students to paraphrase or put meanings in their own words. Things like create daily sentence anagrams for students to solve. So those are all, all suggestions that come right within your book. 
And so the idea for this is that you're gonna identify as you're planning some challenging language. So what is the difficult sentence that you're gonna be working on with them? Which activity will you use to help your students understand that difficult sentence? Will it be a preparation activity or a follow-up? How did your case study students respond to the activity? And how can you further scaffold? So those are the questions that you're gonna be responding to as you work through the bridge to practice for session 6.4. Make sense? Excellent. Uh, for 6.5, I wanna point out that the two that Lee just talked about, three and four and five, could all be the same lesson. So you could do up until the sentence, you could do the whole thing in one lesson and just reflect on them separately because three wants you to reflect on background knowledge and vocabulary, four wants you to reflect on sentence structure, and then five, how are ideas tied together in the text? It wants you to focus on text cohesion. So you could think about what pronoun references will my kids have a hard time with, what um, substitutions will they have a hard time with, conjunctions will they have a hard time with, and you can preview those and give them some strategies to attach them, and this could all be part of that same reading lesson. With this one, you could also do it as a reflection, but what it really wants you to do is in your text that you're doing with your kids, what co cohesive devices might they struggle with? Do they know ellipses yet? And are there ellipses in the text? Are there a lot of pronoun references? And so they're might not sure who he is referring to all the time. So that's what you're going to do with session five. In session six, how does text structure, structure affect comprehension? So this asks you to prepared to teach a story, and you could use the same one that you've been doing. So this could be one lesson for the whole thing. But for six, it wants you to do a, a plan for supporting their reading while they read by using a story grammar or story framework. And those uh, are both in your references. So the story grammar or the story framework are B10 and 11. And so plan to use one of those with your kids and also, as you're planning, be um, purposeful about telling them what type of text they're reading. Are you, were they reading a narrative? Use the story grammar. If it's informational, then use one of the other graphic organizers or even from Wonders, probably, uh, to make it easy for you or one that they're familiar with. And then just be purposeful about telling them we are going to read an informational text with a problem solution. So they start to identify the text features and text structures to aid in their comprehension. So again, this could be all one or three, four, five, and six could be different lessons where you just reflect on them differently. But then after you teach that lesson using the uh, graphic organizer, how did it go? And did knowing the text structure seem to help your kids comprehension a little bit? Any question, Tanya, about any of the assignments? No, I think this is actually good because this way, since they all are cohesive, well, at least 6-3 through 6-6, six, six, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, um, we can use the same passage in our Wonders book and use that for the bridge to practices so that it will it's much easier that way. Or, you know, maybe there's one that's more pertinent to a passage that's separate and that can be done also. So it's good to know there is um, some leeway there. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Make it easiest for yourself and for your students too. Great. Okay. okay. So as we move forward, as always, uh, we are going to be doing the walkthrough observations for your uh, case study student, for your schools, and your um, admin and coach will decide which classrooms we go to when we come out to do our walkthroughs, but they'll be observing all the teachers, at, just like we did last year, all the K-3 teachers. 
Um, so they were doing two observations each time this year. One is the general classroom atmosphere observation. And that is just very basic things like your pacing, oral language, um, your wait time, are there goals, spiraling back to support review and that kind of thing. So that's a real simple, um, and we just observe, you know, yes, we saw it, no, we didn't see it. And if we have any notes or suggestions that we may want to follow up with, um, and your coach would probably give you that feedback just like we did last year. And then the next one is the text comprehension walkthrough. And these are the specific things that we are looking for when we do the unit six walkthrough. So there are things like um, text choice, um, preparation before reading, uh, questioning, what questions did you ask? So, and I know that you are aware that in Wonders, they have a plethora of questions to choose from, and you can't do them all because there's just not enough time in the world for anybody to do them all. So you want to spend time thinking about which questions am I going to ask and how does that support um, you know, how you choose the check marks that are the big rocks at the beginning of the tab in the story in the unit. So choose your questions according to that. And those are the kind of things that we'll be looking for that cohesion there. Um, and encouraging independent reading. I think one of the beautiful things about Wonders is that with the four text sets that all have the same essential question and the same central theme, our kids develop a pretty good knowledge and background for each of the text set topics. And so they are able to do more reading. And I know in first grade, probably they can't read independently fluidly yet, but um, with a support of 95% and the decoding reading that they do there, and with the rereads and the reading analysis read. So we are doing that close read routine with the three reads built into wonders. Those are the chances that kids will have to do the reading um, either independently or starting off probably earlier in the year with some of those other structures for reading like echo read, dyad reading, close reading, and you just stop, you know, when you come to one of those vocabulary words or whatever it might be. So I think using your teacher judgment and your agility to choose exactly how you're going to scaffold that, knowing that the goal is for them to be able to read the text independently and fluently at some point, but probably not today or tomorrow for, you know, kids that can't really read yet. So back to our learning intention, which was learning comprehension strategies and routines so I can incorporate them into my classroom instruction to deepen student comprehension of text. That is what we hope that these worksheets and bridge to practice exercises in unit six will help you learn to do better we know that you are doing a lot and we know there's a lot of those strategies already built into Wonders to support you. So this is, is not gonna be a huge leap, I think for anyone. Um, and the success is you'll know you're successful when your students can read text and then speak and write about it. And that's where the reader writer companion can be really critical is once when you do your reading, they there's a lot of chatter built into wonders and so we want them partner speaking we want them speaking in small groups and creating written pieces in their readers writers notebook that respond to the text so they're not just you know wild crazy well i had a cat when i was a kid it's like well no let's this is a story about um spiders let's let's tell what we know about spiders 
So it's um, very purposeful writing and it's analytical writing, which is kind of a different kind of writing than we were used to doing with Reading Street. Questions? Will you remind me where the observation um, templates are? Are those in Canvas? I think, I think you're muted. Oh, oh, it says not, but we can't no? hear you. Will you try again? <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Will you remind me where the templates are for the observations? Were those in Canvas? So, uh, you know what? I We can put them there, and I think we should. They are on the um, agenda page here. So this will be linked in Canyon View by morning. And okay. they're also uh, and they're also linked on that slide. So okay. I think Canvas is a good place for them and too. your coach has all of them for the entire year. Great. Then check with your coach as well. Good Great. Point. Any other questions? Nope. Well, as our only participant today, Tanya, we got a little bag. Would Where like is everybody? Oh, it's a busy week. Uh, would you like a timer or with a couple of extra goodies or a buzzer? Ooh. It doesn't have a battery in it yet, but it'll go buzz. <laughs> Ooh, let's do a timer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, Tanya. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.